no one has seen anything remotely like this. Some are calling it a 1,000 year flood, rivers at levels never seen in recorded history. That river was so angry and so wild. I like lost my absolute mind. I was like, oh my God, I'm dead, this is over. Streams across southern Montana jumped their banks, transforming streets into rivers. You couldn't believe how harsh and how fast the water was going through my property here. Roads crumbled, bridges were swept away. Oh my gosh. And homes were literally pulled from their foundations and into raging rivers. Now begins the long road to recovery. Communities are coming together, neighbors helping neighbors, even complete strangers pitching in to help Montana clean up and rebuild. We help each other. It's kind of the way of the world here. From MTN News, this is Troubled Waters, Montana's Historic Floods. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us from the banks of Rock Creek and Red Lodge. I'm Russ Friesinger. And I'm Diane Parker. It was one of the largest natural disasters in Montana history. Rock Creek began spilling its banks and pouring into downtown Red Lodge. Much of the town was underwater. This aerial video shows the scope of the devastation. Dozens of homes and businesses were destroyed. It was a sight this town had never seen. Our Casey Conlon was here in Red Lodge that fateful Monday when it all began as residents rushed to safety. Bridge right here running over Rock Creek. Now Rock Creek has completely overtaken it, washed it out as water continues to flow down Broadway into these buildings. It's just some of the massive damage it's already caused. And officials say, unfortunately, this may just be the beginning. This is going to be weeks. Uh, this is a significant uh, impact. The East Side Road Bridge just north of Rock Creek Resort was the first to fail Sunday night, but Red Lodge Fire Chief Tom Kuntz says that was just the beginning. Shortly we lost the uh, 19th Street Bridge, uh, then we lost the 9th Street Bridge. Chain of events began to happen so quickly it was difficult to keep up with. In all, seven bridges were damaged or completely destroyed in the area by Monday morning. This is one of the few that survived mostly intact but remained impassable. They have not seen the creek get this high in their memory, and they've lived here all of their life. Um, so it's definitely a historic event. And that's bringing out the looky-loos, which is causing disaster personnel all kinds of headaches. Our biggest message now is to please, please stay away from these waterways. Things are changing so rapidly. The bank could just drop away underneath you. Yeah, check back with us either at this number. An early command center is set up at the Carbon County Personal Services Building. Hundreds of homes and businesses have flood damage, but there are bigger problems now, starting with the town's power supply. The transmission lines, the bank that they're supported by has eroded. One of these poles you can see here fell into the river Monday afternoon, leaving the town almost completely in the dark. This is what the town pump looked like around 3 p.m. and this could last for days. Due to the high stream flows, uh, Northwestern Energy is not sure what their ability will be to, to fix or replace that power line anytime soon. Red Lodge was one of more than a dozen communities that found itself underwater. Near Nye, some 80 Sabanye Stillwater miners and Woodbine campers found themselves stranded after the road washed out and had to be rescued by raft. Our Alina Howder was there and detailed the rescue efforts to bring them to safety. Camping trips are often adventurous, but Justin Sheely never expected anything like what happened this weekend. Sheely, his wife, and five-year-old daughter were staying at Woodbine Campground when they were told they needed to evacuate. And we're just kind of going, wow, okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> they and more than 60 other campers moved their vehicles to higher ground and started walking toward the river where they were met by search and rescue crews. Thus began a raft ride across the river to safety. Where we're seeing whole trees being swept underneath the bridge. My vehicle is in line with about two dozen other vehicles and campers and RVs there. And they weren't the only ones stranded. Just down the road at the Stillwater Mine, miners were also stranded. The road completely washed out. Residents in the area rushed to help their neighbors evacuate. It's something that you can't even dream about because there's nobody that's ever seen this. Many piling sandbags to try and protect properties as the water crept closer to homes. We were trying to uh, head the water off and, and from uh, this 
area right here so it wouldn't flood the homes back up in here. Lives thrown upside down and damage that will take a long time to repair. In Nye, Alina Howder, MTN News. The Montana National Guard also used Chinook helicopters to rescue around 80 people who were stranded at East Rosebud Lake. The road to East Rosebud completely washed out. Those stranded at the lake say they expected to be stuck there for weeks. In fact, the group was meeting to decide how to survive for the foreseeable future when all of a sudden they say their rescuers arrived. In that meeting, all of a sudden we heard a helicopter and we're like, what is that? It was so wild. I don't even know what it's called, but this giant sky bus, <laughs> like it was huge, just dropped in the middle of camp. All of those people were flown here to Red Lodge maybe quite a well before they're able to retrieve their vehicle. Now this has become a pretty common sight over the past couple of weeks. Homes literally hovering over the riverbanks, but one of the most dramatic scenes that we have seen comes from Gardner. This home housing National Park Service employees was literally torn from the banks of the Yellowstone River and swept downstream. MTN's Kagan Harsha caught up with one of the families who lived there. I hardly believed it was happening, kind of really didn't think it was possible until we saw it fall on the river. Many Montana families had their homes damaged in Monday's floods, but very few had them literally pulled into raging rivers in such dramatic fashion. We raised our two girls there. They just couldn't believe it, you know. Ramon and Nicole Perez work for the National Park Service, and they've lived here for the past five years. Four other families also called this building home. Our apartment was the one that ripped off first, so you could see. You, you can see some of our daughter's pictures flapping in the wind on the wall. Yeah, that was kind of hard. You could see some of our stuff in the house right before it went. Shalene Dar lives downstream, and it was one of the many who watched as the home floated past her kitchen window, eventually crashing into this bridge. Oh! Um, and the house was basically floating down the river. She and others in and near Gardner were stuck in the community until Tuesday afternoon when Highway 89 North was finally reopened to Livingston, allowing tourists to leave. And you know, being on vacation and being stuck somewhere, a little eerie, I think. And residents like Shalene to stock up on groceries and supplies. Definitely people um, are walking around, not really sure about what to do. The road may be back open, but for families like this one, the nightmare is far from over. A natural disaster that ripped homes from riverbanks and turned lives upside down. Yeah, we lost everything. We have five days worth of clothes and, and a backpack full of toys. So, yeah, it's a it, lot. It's a, it's a big loss seeing your house float away like that. It's not easy. Near Gardner, Kagan Harsha, MTN News. And farther downstream, flooding also forced the evacuation of residents in Livingston. Search and rescue crews tell us the number of stranded homeowners who had to be rescued was too many to count. Many in Livingston are used to flooding, but they never expected the water to rise so high. Never, never. I mean, there's there's high historic floods, but you know, our house has uh, kind of been an island in the past. Well, it's not anymore. The National Weather Service says the Yellowstone River hit its highest levels ever recorded in Park County, even above the high water mark set during historic flooding back in 1918 and 1997. One of the towns hardest hit by the flooding is Fromberg. We know that at least 100 homes and 300 buildings were either damaged or destroyed by the flooding. The Clarks Fork River basically took out the entire east side of of town. Many residents here say this is the first time they've ever experienced flooding, which is why most who live in Fromberg did not have flood insurance. No, I don't think anybody here does. Uh, if, if it was even available, I don't think anybody could afford it. By the sounds of all the talk, it just sounds like nobody has flood insurance. Many homeowners without insurance are now hoping for aid from the federal government through FEMA. Still ahead on this hour-long MTN special, Troubled Waters, a scene all too familiar to many here in Montana. A Park City home is swept off its foundation nearly 40 years after a Montana veteran built it by hand. And a little later, we'll tour Yellowstone National Park as its gateway communities fear the summer tourism season may be swept away by the ferocious floodwaters. If you'd like to help those affected by these historic floods, please visit our MTN flood relief page at ktvq.com slash floods. Your tax deductible contribution will help rebuild our communities. We now return to Troubled Waters. 
Authorities now tell us that 11 homes were destroyed in Stillwater County and at least 80 others suffered extensive damage. And one of those homes was in Park City. It was a house built by a veteran nearly 40 years ago. In a matter of minutes, though, it was toppled into the Yellowstone River and was carried downstream. Our Haley Monaco has the story. As the high river levels now move towards the Billings area, one Park City man is dealing with something he never expected. And when it fell, this thing started just popping and cracking. And Mike Kinsey has poured blood, sweat, and tears into his dream home along the banks of the Yellowstone River. He built it by hand 40 years ago using a chainsaw and telephone poles. You'd have had to have seen it when, it, when I got it all done. It turned out to be a two-story log home that me and my wife and three boys lived in for a long time. <laughs> But what took this 74-year-old veteran years to build <laughs> fell apart in a matter of seconds. Right at 3 o'clock in the morning, it just sloughed off and the river just carried it away. Kinsey has seen the Yellowstone River rise and fall throughout the years, and flooding has always been a concern. But he never expected his home would be ripped into the river. We always were able to save it before and not this time. Breaks my heart, <laughs> really does. I just don't even know what to think right now. Kinsey returned Wednesday morning to see the full damage in the daylight and what was possibly left. I was pretty sure this would be gone this morning. I'm kind of amazed that it's here. Kinsey feels fortunate he was able to live along the river for as long as he did. Amazingly, in such a devastating situation, he was still able to find time to laugh. Yeah, I've had flood insurance the whole time I've owned the house, but I've never had a claim. <laughs> Obviously, I do now. In Park City, Haley Monaco, MTN News. In many flooded communities, safe drinking water was hard to find. A boil order was in effect here in Red Lodge until Wednesday. And Montana's largest city was also facing a potential crisis last week. Water from the Yellowstone River rushed into the Billings Water Treatment Plant, causing the facility to shut down operation for the first time ever. Luckily, normal operations were able to continue the next day as river levels receded, but residents were forced to conserve water and many rushed to stores in Billings, clearing the shelves of all the bottled water. We'll be right back with more as we roll on with this hour-long MTN special, Troubled Waters. Stay with us. The generosity of Montanans knows no bounds, and that's been shown by contributions to our MTN flood relief effort. In the past week, you've donated nearly $35,000 to help our communities rebuild. To help further the cause, the Montana Television Network, along with the Scripps Howard Foundation, will contribute another $25,000 bringing the total to right around $60,000. It's not too late to make a difference. Just text FLOODS to 345-345 and see how you can help. We now return to Troubled Waters. Welcome back to Red Lodge. The devastating floods caused extensive damage in more than a dozen Montana towns, but just up the road here in Yellowstone National Park, many feared an entire summer could be lost. Fortunately, the outlook has improved. The southern half of the park reopened this week, and as MTN's John Shear reports, repairs inside Yellowstone are already underway. Thanks to $50 million from the Federal Highway Administration, the Park Service now says it will have the Northern Loop, shown here in red, back open to visitors in two weeks or less. The Southern Loop, shown in green and yellow, opened at 8 a.m. Wednesday. What will not open within two weeks is the heavily damaged road from Gardner to Mammoth. You see it here in the latest helicopter video. Also not opening quickly is the road from Roosevelt Junction to the northeast entrance, as seen in these photos. But that doesn't mean the park is giving up on those segments of road. First, the old stagecoach road, called the Old Gardner Road, which starts just inside the north gate, is being upgraded for use by emergency services, food supplies, and administrative needs. 
Yellowstone Superintendent Cam Scholey says it's important to get access restored to preserve the economies of gateway communities and park concessionaires. We've got people not only from across America but around the globe that have trips planned to Yellowstone. Uh, anytime you take full hotels of people and say your reservation is canceled and you have to leave, you know, that's not a good thing for, for your business model. Uh, and it's another reason why it's important that we come up with uh, a safe way to get reopened as, as soon as possible. To meet that goal, Sholey promises to try to restore limited visitor access at Mammoth in the coming weeks rather than months or even years. But there is no timeline for that. At the same time, an effort is also underway to create a temporary route to Silvergate and Cook City at the northeast entrance. Both routes will be vital during the winter season because those roads through the park are the only way in or out of those communities once snow blocks roads from the east. John Shearer, MTN News. Until those temporary roads are constructed, communities like Gardner are essentially cut off from the park. And as MTN's Jay Cohn reports, that's taking a huge toll on the many businesses that rely on tourism. grand entryway to America's first national park, Yellowstone's iconic Roosevelt Arch. This weekend it looks a bit lonely. Atop the arch, a phrase from the 1872 legislation that established Yellowstone. It reads, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Unfortunately for the time being, the people are missing. Right now, um, my gallery would usually be full of people. Um, the parking lot would be full. So yeah, quite, quite a stark difference. Hoff's Yellowstone Wild Gallery is one of a handful of stores that are open. Hoff is hoping that his online business can help him survive this latest setback. Between COVID, um, the fires we had two years ago, more COVID, um, and now the flood, um, I'm waiting for the volcano to blow or an earthquake to happen. We just keep getting knocked down and, and getting back up. Sean Dar and her husband Jim own the Little Trail Creek cabins on the edge of Gardner. Today they're just trying to figure out how to deal with a 90% drop in business. Just that one road has cut us off from our lifeline and we are looking at probable loss of most revenue for the entire year for everyone in town. It was rough watching the devastation as it unfolded, um, but you know, coming from a nursing background, to learn that everyone's okay, there was no loss of life, no injuries, I mean, it is just a miracle. At the Gardner Market, Owner Scott Demery is offering free water to anyone who needs it. <laughs> yep, what do you need? Don't be lying to me. What's that? Have we heard anything I think about it's, the water? I think it's going to be Thursday before we hear anything. The town remains under a boil order until the Gardner water system is deemed safe. I'm really concerned about the smaller businesses. 
Um, we'll be fine. You know, some of the bigger businesses, I think, can weather it okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, independent businesses that kind of keep this town running in the summertime that I'm really concerned about. In all the years I've lived here, I've always wondered what it would be like in the summer with Yellowstone out of the picture, you know, just who would come, what it would look like. We're going to find out. There used to be a bridge here that crossed the Yellowstone River. Yes, the Carbella Bridge provided access to the Tom Minor Basin. Now, believe it or not, today, this is all that's left, all that's visible of the Carbella Bridge, a bridge that has stood the test of time for over 100 years. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Structures until Monday when the Yellowstone River showed us all who's in charge. You could hear this twisting metal sound and I turned around and looked at it and watched, you know, it, it tore off its moorings, swung, spun, double endoed kind of, and then went down. All right, that'll do it for you today. Matson Rogers, who owns the Angler's West Fly Shop and Immigrant, drove down to the river early last Monday morning so he could see the situation firsthand. The amount of debris that was coming down the river Monday morning was unprecedented. It was loaded huge trees, chunks, sections, all kinds, just debris was crazy. And I, I'm going to guess to say that all of that was piling up and pinned against that bridge and that force of it coming out of the canyon, it just couldn't take it anymore. Today, the banks of the Yellowstone are littered with logs, debris, in some cases, entire trees. At first glance, this stretch looks like a lumber yard. No one really knew that it was coming. Uh, you know, we all went to bed Sunday night thinking that, well, we're going to have higher water on Monday, but not like that. And the park's iconic wildlife? How did they fare after what the Park Service now calls a 1,000-year flood? And just like the park's wildlife, for the local business community in Gardner, it is survival of the fittest. This is a great little town. I love it. And uh, it's going to be a tough couple of years, but it'll bounce back. It may not be the same, but it'll bounce back. In Gardner, on special assignment, I'm Jay Cohn reporting for MTN News. Gardner isn't the only town cut off from the park. So are the communities of Cook City and Silvergate. Several roads and bridges in around those communities were washed away. In fact, the only way to reach those communities right now is via the Chief Joseph Highway from Cody. The Beartooth Highway suffered damage in at least six locations. The Montana Department of Transportation has already begun repairs, but there's no timeline as to when the work will be complete. MDT said the Beartooth Pass will only need cleanup on the Montana side. Coming up next on this MTN flood special, the nightmares keep coming for one 83-year-old Roscoe woman. First, she loses her husband to routine surgery, and now she loses her home. We'll hear from her as she tries to move forward. If you'd like to help those affected by these historic floods, please visit our MTN flood relief page at ktvq.com slash floods. Your tax deductible contribution will help rebuild our communities. We now return to Troubled Waters. Well, what a couple of weeks it has been. We have seen the worst with the flooding, but also the best with people helping each other out. Roscoe resident Jeanette Ostrom is one of many Montanans now starting over, in her case at 83 years old. She recently lost her husband when he passed away after a fairly routine surgery. And last week, Ostrom's home was swept away by the East Rosebud River. Her family tried to help her save the house, but Mother Nature was just too much. That river was so angry and so wild. I've never seen anything like it. And downriver in Absorkia, a similar story. This drone video shows just a sliver of the devastation there. Multiple homes were underwater. Others picked up and carried away by the raging Stillwater River. Well, many areas around Laurel and Billings escaped major flooding. Residents of Duck Creek returned home to some extensive damage. Our Casey Conlon caught up with residents in that area. I'm in Laurel where the Clark's Fork meets the Yellowstone River. It's a beautiful piece of property that Robert and Sharon Weldon have lived on for about 10 months. They picked it because, well, look at the river views about 200 yards away, or at least that's where it's supposed to be. A couple of days ago, it came right through their property and caused damage they never could have expected. Everybody around here is shocked. That one farmer been here since the mid-60s, and he said he'd never seen anything 
anything like this before. Robert saw the signs. He and his family were bracing with sandbags after Red Lodge's flooding Monday, but it wasn't nearly enough. You couldn't believe how harsh and how fast the water was going through my property here. His biggest concern was his animals, 11 goats, four horses, three dogs, and the strongest of them all, a mule. Only two things survived, cockroaches and a mule. His nephews helped get them all to safety. Hard to stay on the road, we remember the road was? We had to bribe, bribe the mule with, with grain. But while they were doing that, some of Robert's chickens didn't make it. You can tell how heartbroken it made him. I just had back surgery, yeah. spinal surgery, and I'm, you know, my wife and I tried to do as best we could. At least these quails were okay, protected by the shed. You want to keep it? The Weldon's house also took on several feet of water. A neighbor was helping Sharon salvage what they could. The wine will be necessary after all of this. Save that for later. Yeah. <laughs> Don't break those. No. But Robert knows all things considered, it could have been worse. I'm lucky. You know, there's a lot of worse people out there, lot, lost everything. So I'm blessed. Hard to imagine blessed looking like this. But this week has changed a lot of perspective. In Laurel, Casey Kama, MTN News. And coming up, we'll check back in with Casey right here in Red Lodge, where rushing waters poured into homes. Some barely managed to escape. We'll introduce you to a Red Lodge man who kicked out his window with waters rushing into his home, a move that ultimately saved his life. The generosity of Montanans knows no bounds, and that's been shown by contributions to our MTN flood relief effort. In the past week, you've donated nearly $35,000 to help our communities rebuild. To help further the cause, the Montana Television Network, along with the Scripps Howard Foundation, will contribute another $25,000, bringing the total to right around $60,000. It's not too late to make a difference. Just text FLOODS to 345-345 and see how you can help. We now return to Troubled Waters. And welcome back. We have seen so much of the aftermath from the flooding last week in this region, but this street right here in Red Lodge was a raging river at one point during the floods. But what was it like for those who lived here and lived through it? Our Casey Conlon found one man who moved to Red Lodge just last month and barely escaped with his life. I'm on Platte Avenue here in Red Lodge between 13th and 14th streets. This all used to be part of the street, but now you have to walk across these boards just to get over this massive sinkhole. It's where Taylor Monfort Eaton found his car early Monday morning. Normally, that'd be the worst part of your day, but for him, he was thrilled to be alive after almost getting trapped in this basement apartment as water rushed in. And then I made my way out into our living room here, and that's when I you know, realized how bad the situation was. This wasn't what Taylor expected when he left New York for a job at Prerogative Kitchen, one of Red Lodge's most popular spots. This basement apartment less than three blocks away seemed perfect for Taylor's first time living alone until he woke up around 4.30 a.m. Monday. I put my feet down and the water was already up to my calves. He got into the living room and saw some water coming in from the hallway, but once he opened that door, he ran into an avalanche went up and tried to get through my front door, but the water was coming through so hard, I couldn't shoulder the door closed enough to like unlatch the lock. And that's the one moment in this whole thing where I like lost my absolute mind. I was like, oh my God, I'm dead, this is over. All of a sudden it was just like this weird calm and I realized, you know, I'm not, not gonna die today. Taylor went back into his apartment and looked to this egress window. This window has been cracked and water's starting to come through it. I dug out a shoe from underneath the water, put it on, gave it like three or four solid kicks and whoosh, water just started pouring in. Once Taylor kicked the screen away, there was just enough space for him to get through to safety. Luckily, I'm not a big guy. Yeah. <laughs> his upstairs neighbors cleaned up the cuts on his arms and got him up to the fairgrounds for some dry clothes. Once the sun came up, he saw what had happened to his car, the cherry on top. In the four days since, though, he's found some things to smile about. Here's the shoe. It ended up in my kitchen cabinet. I have not moved this because I think it's so, I just think it's so funny. But his biggest win has come from the people around him, helping at every step of the way. 
These people have given me everything in 48 hours. I have a place to stay, I have clothes, I have food. You know, what kind of person are you if you, if you receive all that and you don't feel the drive to get back? I don't know. You won't find any of those people in this town right now. In Red Lodge, Casey Conlon, MTN News. And don't go away as we roll on with this hour-long special as we sit down with Governor Greg Gianforte for our first one-on-one -on -one interview as he reacts to the devastation across South Central Montana. Keep it right here. If you'd like to help those affected by these historic floods, please visit our MTN flood relief page at ktvq.com floods. Your tax-deductible contribution will help rebuild our communities. We now return to Troubled Waters. Tonight, for the first time since the flooding began, MTN had a chance to sit down with Montana Governor Greg Gianforte. Now, the week began with criticism surrounding his whereabouts when the flooding first began. It took him a couple of days to return home from his personal vacation, but since then, he has toured just about every community that endured significant damage. Here's MTN's Judy Slate's conversation with the governor. It was so important. I wanted to be on the ground during the crisis. That's why I worked to expedite my return, cutting our uh, trip short. Uh, and on Friday, I had a chance to do a town hall down in uh, Gardner, hearing from the local folks, and then traveling up to the Flathead, and then getting over to Red Lodge and Fromberg and Epsorki. The needs of each community are somewhat different. It's really devastating to see the loss of bridges, the the uncertainty of not knowing when the north entrance to the park is going to reopen, but Montanans are resilient. And I was thrilled just a few minutes ago to be there when they opened up the 89 bridge. I just a shout out to the Montana Department of Transportation and the private contractors who nearly worked around the clock to get that 89 bridge open so that uh, we can get back to normal. And when you first saw, I mean, some of the images that I've seen have just been so heartbreaking. What do you, what do you feel when you see stuff like that? Well, it's it's tragic. You know, the no one can predict what Mother Nature is going to do, and it, people are reporting this is a 500-year event. Uh, we lost bridges. People lost their belongings in their homes. Uh, it's just it's just tragic. But we can't uh, uh, further complicate it uh, by uh, creating an economic crisis. Uh, here at Chico, they've seen a 25% drop in reservations. What that means to Montanans is they have rooms available. I would encourage you to plan a trip here to Paradise Valley uh, or down to Gardner or over to Red Lodge. I'll be at the Red Lodge Rodeo on the 4th. Maybe go down to Gardner and, and buy a meal down there. All that would help keep the wheels on for these small businesses uh, so they can move forward. Now there is a lot of funds that are going to be coming in, uh, both state funds and federal funds, and how do you prioritize you know, where, where to start helping first? How does that process work? Yeah, so the first thing we did was get the FEMA disaster declaration filed. We did that within 24 hours of the initial thing. We've just amended it today to include individual assistance. Uh, we had to document some of the losses first before we could do that. We're also culling through all of the state agencies and other programs. We've had farmers and ranchers lose irrigation infrastructure and water's essential to agricultural production. Uh, we're also looking at what tools we might have in the Department of Commerce to help promote tourism, particularly in these uh, communities where they've lost reservations. So when does money start rolling out, or, or has it already? Well, we've already done it. I mean, we've already opened up the 89 bridge. I mean, the first, the, the priorities are really get the bridges and roads rebuilt, get the park open again, get the assistance to the individuals, uh, and that's really critical for our rebuilding. Still to come, through the devastation, heroes are born. We meet a Red Lodge restaurant owner who's helping not only homeless employees, but the entire community. We'll show you how. The generosity of Montanans knows no bounds, and that's been shown by contributions to our MTN flood relief effort. In the past week, you've donated nearly $35,000 to help our communities rebuild. To help further the cause, the Montana Television Network, along with the Scripps Howard Foundation, will contribute another $25,000, bringing the total to right around $60,000. It's not too late to make a difference. Just text FLOODS to 345 Three, four, five, and see how you can help. We now return to Troubled Waters. Over the 
the past hour, we've showed you the devastation caused by the floods. Now we want to turn our attention to the many heroes who emerged in the aftermath. So here in Red Lodge, folks have really come together to help rebuild, but they've also come from afar to help out. MTN's David J. explains. We're on Platte Avenue South in Red Lodge. A lot of volunteers, a lot of people out here helping to clean up. And it's not only the community of Red Lodge, but the community outside of Red Lodge that also is helping. The equipment gets picked up after the bucket brigade took out water and dirt from basements. Red Lodge is in a cleanup phase where everything that's been destroyed and come out of the houses are being loaded into side dumps and into end dumps. Um, and that's really what the town needs now. David Cook took time off from his job working with Langless on a project at Big Sky, and Red Lodge is his home. I definitely had moments where I needed to pull myself away from the crews so that I could take a moment to try to hold it together and, and to let a little bit go, to let some tears go. Um, you know there's a lot of people that lost a lot, but there's a huge amount of people that have come together to, to help. Earlier, volunteers cleared this pile of dirt from one home's yard, and on Saturday, they cleared the basement. His basement had about six feet of flooding in it, so we're just kind of getting anything out that we can get out, everything out that we can get out. Brianna Moore lives in Billings, is one of several who came in to work through the Red Lodge Community Foundation. Montana has such a neighborhood feel anyway, no matter if you're, you know, six hours away or half an hour away, so coming out and helping wherever is needed is much, much rewarding. About 40 players from the MSU Bobcats football team came to Red Lodge. We have one young man from Red Lodge on our team. We had another one coming this next year. Uh, a couple guys on our, our squad, their, their uncle is the, the head football coach and superintendent here. You know, I just told our guys, if this is your hometown, you'd want people out there helping. So a uh, great response from our team and we're excited to be here today. We didn't find any news releases and it looks like the team was just doing it to help and not for the attention. As with many college coaches, it provided another opportunity in guiding young men. The support we get is amazing from across our state. So to be able to give back however we can, whether that's in Bozeman or like this here in Red Lodge, I think it's something that our guys appreciate, understand, and love doing. And those living in the flooded homes welcome the help from the volunteers. We're all neighbors, and we all work in the same community and see each other every single day. So there wasn't a question about who we should be where we should be all hands on deck. And I know that all those of us that are flooded are very appreciative. The help that Red Lodge has given me and the help that I've received from everyone is, it's like what gets me up in the morning right now. In Red Lodge, David J, MTN News. One week after the flooding in Red Lodge, many are trying to figure out where to go from here. That includes many employees here at Prerogative Kitchen. Nearly half of their employees lost their homes to the flooding. The floodwaters in Red Lodge turned streets into rivers and poured into homes, businesses, and any building in its path. Gina Berghoff is one of three owners at Prerogative Kitchen in downtown Red Lodge, which was just starting to kick off the summer rush when Rock Creek spilled its banks. The flooding left six of the restaurant's 15 employees homeless. One guy had to slip, knock his way out of a window because the water was coming in with such force and he literally lost everything. That employee was Taylor Monfort Eaton. He gave us a tour of the damage last week. I dug out a shoe from underneath the water, put it on, gave it like three or four solid kicks and whoosh, water just started pouring in. Berghoff is now helping Monfort Eaton and her other employees with places to stay. She arranged for camper trailers to be brought in from Cody, Wyoming, and is housing her workers on her property. Which are great for temporary, but we, with the housing crisis, we just need permanent housing. And Prerogative Kitchen isn't just helping its employees. It offered its whole menu for free on Friday for anyone who needed it while accepting donations raising about $1,000 for their employees. The restaurant is also a part of a gift card brigade to help businesses in town. People can donate or purchase a gift card to a business and Berghoff will distribute those to the Red Lodge community and surrounding areas. Though Berghoff is worried about her own business, she is still doing everything possible to help those around her. Oh, you don't have a, you don't have a choice, you know? I mean, when you see all your friends struggling on that east side of town and you know, they're losing their incomes. A lot of those uh, basements that were affected were basement apartments. There's literally nowhere for people to go. You just have to pull through. In Red Lodge, Haley Monaco, MTN News.
Stay with us. There is more to come on the MTN special Troubled Waters right after the break. If you'd like to help those affected by these historic floods, please visit our MTN flood relief page at ktvq.com floods. Your tax deductible contribution will help rebuild our communities. We now return to Troubled Waters. Welcome back. Here in Red Lodge, there have been too many community heroes to count. Strangers have pitched in to help strangers in the wake of the flooding. Our Casey Conlon takes a closer look. The Yodler is an icon in Red Lodge. The building has been standing for over 100 years, and it's been a motel housing guests from all over the world for almost 60. But it likely will never be the same. Last week's flooding completely destroyed all 10 downstairs units, four of which had people in them at the time. We weren't notified at all. In fact, since the flood, we have not had any city official contact us, period. Have they given you any reason why not? No. Yodler owner Tulsa Dean says she and her husband only found out the motel was flooding when a guest called their emergency line. He called me at 5.30 a.m. letting us know that there was three inches of water in his room. City officials say they sent out a code red alert to local cell phones that had signed up for the service, and then they started notifying people in person. Door to door, knocking on folks' is, is, uh, uh, houses, and we, we, we successively built that area bigger and bigger. It is uh, challenging to get everyone. Dean is frustrated that the motel is one they missed, but she's devastated at what the damage now means for half of her beloved yodeler. I mean, there would be no reason to rebuild them because we don't have any income, insurance won't cover it because it's a flood, and we just simply don't have the money. About 5 p.m., this was literally seeping out in the parking lot and all the way up the doors. Dean took us inside the ground floor units. They're completely gutted. More than 100 people have volunteered their time to help over the last week. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Very much so. It's the reason the Deans moved here in the first place. We thought this was the coolest town in Montana. The just gratitude and giving of our community, like, hey, I want to help you. And that's been huge. The apartment, um, we lived in here for about four years. This is the north end of the motel's bottom floor and maybe the saddest sight for Dean. But then came a ray of sunshine when they were demoing the walls this weekend. I'm guessing this was from the mining days. Um, of a skiing mural. This mural, which she believes comes from the days when the Rocky Fork Mine used the building as apartments, spans three different walls in the room. It looks like something to maybe Red Lodge, but I don't know, I'm not sure. But pretty cool, pretty cool history. Something the Yodler will always be a part of, no matter what comes next. In Red Lodge, Casey Conlon, MTN News. The generosity of Montanans knows no bounds, and that's been shown by contributions to our MTN flood relief effort. In the past week, you've donated nearly $35,000 to help our communities rebuild. To help further the cause, the Montana Television Network, along with the Scripps Howard Foundation, will contribute another $25,000, bringing the total to right around $60,000. It's not too late to make a difference. Just text FLOODS to 345 three, four, five, and see how you can help. And as we say goodnight to you from Red Lodge, we realize the long road to recovery has just begun. Well, Montana has been through a lot these past couple of weeks, but the resiliency of communities like Red Lodge is certainly awe-inspiring. We want to thank you for watching tonight and for making MTN your source for news. Good night, everyone. <laughs>